Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our second Dean Series event of the fall semester. Tonight is a very special celebration, 35 years of the UC Berkeley Wellness Letter, which has now expanded into a suite of publications that we call the UC Berkeley Health and Wellness Publications. In October 1984, after two years of planning, the first edition of the UC Berkeley Wellness Letter was published. That first edition gave its readers a guide to, a guide to picking out a pair of running shoes, the science of Nicorette gum, advice on selecting and storing tofu, and other lifestyle tips pertaining to health, packaged in an eight-page printed newsletter. 35 years later, 40 million people have subscribed to the wellness letter over the years. 30 million people have subscribed to Health After 50, and as envisioned by its founders, who felt strongly that the resources generated from the newsletter should directly benefit our students, more than $14 million in fellowship support has been provided to our students as a result of this important work. Now, some of the people involved since the very beginning are here today, and I want to give them a special shout out. John Schwartzberg, chair of the Wellness Letter Editorial Board, and one of my favorite professors ever. <laughs> Dale Ogard, who has served as the managing editor of the Wellness Letter since the very beginning. I'm sorry that Shelley Morgan is no longer with us. Shelley, along with Dale and Michael Goldstein and former Dean Joyce Lashoff, conceived of the Wellness Letter and made it happen. Shelley was also my thesis advisor and a special friend. The topic of my thesis was compassion in American medicine, and I couldn't have picked a better advisor. Shelley was in every way the embodiment of caring and compassion, and one of the best role models I could have ever hoped of what being a doctor is all about. And finally, I also just want to thank our publishing partner at Remedy Health Media, in part particular Mike Kinnan, who flew out from New York with some of his team to join us for the celebration tonight. Mike, thank you and your team for being here. I am so grateful to each of you for your work and with the Wellness Letter over the years and very proud of the collective work that we are doing to bring high quality wellness and health information uh, through, the, uh, through, through the wellness letter and related publications that it remains one of the most trusted sources of health information in America is really something worth celebrating. Now, I've been a dean for about four months now, still on the very steep part of the learning curve. Uh, but one thing that I've learned is that you want to stop talking uh, before people stop listening, uh, which I've been told for deans is about two minutes. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor John Schwartzberg and Dale Ogard, who will speak briefly about what the Wellness Letter has meant to the public and to our School of Public Health. And then John will then introduce our esteemed speaker tonight, uh, uh, Christopher Gardner, uh, who is a proud Cal alum. Uh, but uh, now also a professor at the school, I understand, uh, that's known as the Berkeley of the South Bay, uh, <laughs> to, to share his perspective on nutrition science. Hey, John, Dale. Hi, my name is Dale Ogar, and I think I'm the oldest now <laughs> of the, well, not quite, of uh, the wellness team we did get this, pull this all together in 1984 after two years of wrangling with the university over how it would be possible to have a money-making um, operation running in conjunction with this ivory tower university. Things have changed a lot since then, but it took us two years to convince them that this was a good idea. This all came about, Michael mentioned Sheldon Margan, who was well known for being the person you came to whenever you had a weird idea that nobody else would listen to. And uh, Rodney Friedman, who 
down in that picture. Rodney was a publisher from New York and had a very successful company. He came to visit us wearing rollerblades and shorts and a backpack, not what we expected from a New York publisher. And he, ex he told us that he had a great idea to go head to head with the Harvard Medical Letter and publish a health letter on the East Coast with a university. Sadly, he, being a basketball player, he didn't, he'd never heard of Berkeley. And <laughs> those of you who have season tickets know why. Um, so he went to UCLA where he was more familiar and offered them the opportunity to do the wellness letter and they turned him down. So he came up here, proposed this, we worked on it for two years and at the end of two years, and with, I should mention, uh, Joyce Lashoff, who was the dean of the School of Public Health at that time, the first female dean of a graduate school in the entire country. Uh, Joyce was almost going to be with us here tonight. She's 93 years old, in great shape. We had dinner with her last night, and she's very sorry she couldn't be here. But she was so supportive that when the faculty revolted against this whole idea, she said, no, we're going to do it, and I'm going to be take full responsibility for every word that's published in this. And she was good to her word for all those years. So uh, Michael Goldman, who is also here tonight, was with us from the very beginning. He is uh, someone who knew, I think, nothing about science and now knows everything about science. <laughs> he was a wonderful, wonderful partner to work with over all these years, and he's just recently retired. So. Um, you can see now that we, we have here the first issue of the wellness letter. We also have some examples of the, the wellness letter and health after 50, and we have some samples of those outside. This has been a really incredible journey. Um, I have spent most of my adult life in the School of Public Health, and it has been such a joy to watch what this has done for the school in terms of the effect on the students who got fellowships and grants and travel money and a lot of other things they just wouldn't have had access to if we hadn't stuck with this over the years. So I'm very, very proud to be here today and um, you know, thrilled that we can celebrate 35. In the next five more years, it'll be 40. <laughs> right? And I may or may not still be here. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is John Schwartzberg, and I've had the uh, honor to be the editor of the uh, UC Berkeley Wellness Letter since uh, 2000, so 19 years now. Um, and I wanted to actually acknowledge uh, someone in the audience, uh, Steve Shortell, who's here, who was so instrumental in making this transition to our, our wonderful partners in New York. Um, so I want a round of thanks to you very much so. Um, I also want to um, give a big thanks to um, my wife for putting up with me living in front of the computer editing <laughs> for 19 years now. Uh, the, we've, the, the wellness letter is actually, uh, as uh, uh, Michael Liu said, um, has morphed into something more than just the wellness letter. Um, several years ago, it's been about three years ago now, we, we took over... Um, what used to be the Johns Hopkins Health After 50 newsletter, uh, which is a, a newsletter that focuses primarily on disease, whereas the wellness letter focuses primarily on prevention. So the two have really nicely complemented ourselves. And that's been a lot of fun to be working on both sides of, of, of these newsletters. But in addition, um, we have uh, wellness reports from the wellness letter side that uh, consolidate a lot of the things we talk about during the year and publish every year. And the Hopkins, on the Hopkins side, or now the white paper side, what we call it, uh, excuse me, the um, Health After 50 side, we have uh, uh, 14 white papers that focus on a, on a variety of really important diseases, prostate problems for males, a variety of um, women's health problems, coronary artery disease, strokes, and so on. So we publish these annually, and so that's, those publications have been great to, to add. We also have digital reports that focus more on more timely topics that we can send out digitally. And we've digitized now the wellness letter so that people can subscribe by um, just online as opposed to on paper. I, I don't understand why anybody would want to subscribe online when you can get it on paper, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm dating myself. Um, so we have the digitized reports. 
Uh, so so we, now we have what we call university health and wellness publications. It's uh, a panoply of, uh, of different ways to reach the public. And what this is all about and what this has been about from the inception is really two things. The most important thing is to reach the public with good, well-vetted information uh, because there's so much poor, non-vetted information that the public has free access to. And that was our major purpose, and that's the purpose of a big piece of public health. Um, the other was that, um, as Dale had mentioned, the, um, the revenues that come in to us for our efforts go to our students to support them to train new public health professionals. So it's a win-win. We have a variety of new ideas or ideas that we think are really important that, we, we wanna, uh, that we're looking forward to in the next five to 10 years. We have a nascent uh, Spanish edition with a, uh, a joint project with Transamerica. Um, we published a variety of Spanish articles on uh, articles in Spanish on hypertension, on diabetes, heart disease, and these are all um, vetted from uh, public health, from um, the wellness letter information as well as Health After 50, and from our uh, associate editor Marlon Moss, a professor in our school, um, who is um, whose first language is Spanish. So it's very fortunate to have that. We also have what we call our Pacific Rim Initiative. Um, we, we publish in the World Journal, which is the largest uh, Chinese um, uh, published newspaper in the United States, in the North America, actually. And we have a um, monthly article in, uh, a, from a university in uh, Taipei. And we're looking to grow um, our presence in, um, in Asia as much as we can, because we think that's a an audience that really could use the information that we have. Um, so those are all, the World Journal and the, uh, the articles in Taipei, those are published uh, in Chinese. So we're, we're constantly looking for ways to reach the public and the public that really needs our information. So I think that's my two minutes, Michael. Um, I was gonna say something about your being a student, but I won't do that tonight, okay. <laughs> So, it's, uh, so I want to introduce our speaker. I, I'm just absolutely thrilled. Um, I really am absolutely thrilled to have Christopher Gardner here tonight. Um, as was mentioned, you might ask the question, why would somebody from that other school in the Bay Area be up here? But he did get, as Michael mentioned, a PhD here at, at Berkeley, so we, we felt it was fair game. Christopher has published such important information about nutrition uh, in some of them, the most prestigious journals in the United States. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have him um, be a source of uh, articles uh, for us in the wellness letter, and as well, he's the editor of one of our white papers on health and nutrition. So um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's just a thrill to have you here, Christopher. Let me give you a little bit of his background. Besides getting his PhD here, which was in 1993, uh, he then matriculated to Stanford, and he's now the uh, Renborg Farquhar Endowed Professorship of Medicine, um, which is a very prestigious position there. I looked at his CV. He has over 66 peer-reviewed published papers, plus innumerable chapters in books. And for the past 20 years, he's been doing a lot of focused research on a variety of things, such as vegetarian diets, soy food and soy components, garlic, omega-3 fats, fish oil, flax oil, antioxidants, ginkgo biloba, popular weight loss diets. Uh, the most recent um, uh, uh, paper that he published that uh, we immediately picked up on and wrote about was published in JAMA in the, um, I think it was the winter of 2018, um, that looked, it was called the Diet Fit Study, that looked at 609 generally healthy people uh, that were um, overweight, obese adults, and he they compared a low fat, versus high fat, uh, low carb versus high fat diets. And looked at these folks for, which is unusual for nutrition studies for, I think it was about a year, which was remarkable in and of itself. And also looked at genetics in the background. And I suspect he may talk a little bit about this. Um, essentially showing, well, I'll let him tell you what it showed. But it was a very important study published in JAMA. Um, the couple other things I want to say before, I'm gonna turn, turn the mic over to Christopher. Um, he has coined this term stealth nutrition. And what, what he's very interested in is the idea of how can public health has not been very successful in communicating nutrition to the public. 
And how can we be more successful? And he has this idea that I think is just absolutely outstanding of combining public health nutrition with the idea of global warming and climate change. Public health with food and animal rights welfare, with food and human labor abuses like slaughterhouses, agricultural fields, fast food restaurants, and so on. So very, very important way of bringing these two things together to, to make uh, nutrition more profound to the public. The other is uh, an interest in institutional foods and how to make food options, which, which he and others have called unapologetically delicious. This is a collaboration between Stanford and the Culinary Institute of America. And um, uh, I hope you have something to say about that as well. Great. OK, without further ado, Christopher Gardner. <clears throat> I cannot even tell you what an honor this is to be here. Total bucket list. This is, ah, oh, I, if you were to go back to my house right now, you would see this huge stack of Berkeley wellness letters dog-eared with um, all kinds of sticky notes, fish oil, garlic, uh, whatever the thing of the month was. And I like put little notes. Every time I was confused or somebody asked me, I would rush back to my Berkeley wellness letter and say, well, what were those points? What was the narrative again? Got it. Okay. And I would go and bring sanity to the conversation. So... Oh, my God, what a thrill. OK, wait, I just realized I have to switch my slides in here. OK, this is what I was told to do. Let's see if that works. <coughs> On your mark, it's set. OK, so um, I, I just couldn't be more pleased. I'm so thrilled. And uh, I'm starting to tweet, so maybe I'll put this on Twitter for myself at some point and see, <laughs> see how many likes I get from that. I'm going to take you on a wild slide ride. And remind me again, we have about an hour, so what, we're going to have 20 minutes at the end for, for talking, right? OK, so wherever I am in, in 40-ish minutes, I've got my little uh, timer here, unless there's a clock. No, they're not clocking me. I should have that red light, yellow light thing up here. That would be good. OK, so I'm going to clock myself. This is the ride we're going to take. It's kind of where are we right now? And there's some good and there's bad to where we are right now. So let's share some of those perspectives. And, I'd really like to end on a more aspirational note, part of what was just suggested, that it's, um, it's not really just about nutrition and health. It's a lot about behavior change. And we really have not done well just banging people over the head with grams of fiber and uh, milligrams of antioxidants. So we need a new approach to make this happen. OK, get ready, wild ride. So there are a number of people out there who have worked on dietary <laughs> guidelines. There's at least three organizations that I've worked with, and I've really always been impressed how much agreement there is. I know it looks like there's a ton of disagreement, but man, when I'm on these committees and we're all talking about the evidence, and we don't make up new evidence, we look at the evidence, it, it hasn't changed all that much. It's kind of a lot of those things on the left and some of the things on the right, and please try to avoid the things on the bottom. Um, another way I like to think of where we need to move in all that, not just what you should do, but where do we need to move and I actually got to moderate a debate between Lauren Cordain doing paleo, Joel Furman doing vegan, and Mibi Guarneri doing Mediterranean. And they were bickering and drawing, you know, cherry picking their studies. And at the end, I said, but what do you agree on? And I got them all to agree on this, and that this is about half of America's problem right there. And so instead of bickering around the fringe, what is it you agree on? We need more vegetables and whole foods and less added sugars or fine grains. And process. I think we got 100% agreement on that. I think we got 98% agreement on this. OK, there's lectins in beans. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Yes, fruits have sugar. Yes, there's fat in nuts. Yes, there's cholesterol in eggs. Let's go over the metabolism if you want. Not that big a deal. Yes, if you're vegetarian, fish have a face. And so maybe that's a reason to avoid it. But you know, for the most part, I can get almost everybody to agree on those, right? OK, then let's take another step. Dairy and poultry get a little more dicey, right? So let, let's see if we want to have a fight or not, because we could choose to go a couple different ways. We could talk about the ice cream and all the sugar. We could really get caught up in all the different kinds of milk or the alt milks. And can you call it milk? Do you actually milk the udder of an almond? No, you don't, <laughs> but that's OK. We could still call it milk. Boy, lots of cheeses out there, but yogurt, isn't yogurt heartwarming until you get that low-fat kind that's full of fruit and it's really just a sugar delivery system? 
And we have a lot of people who are lactose intolerant, so that changes the whole conversation. Or if it's poultry, are we really talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken or Buffalo Wings or concentrated animal feeding operations? Or on the right, are we talking pasture-raised, antibiotic-free chicken, which is really on the rise now? And on dairy, are we talking about it being a great source of calcium and the hot new topic of probiotics in yogurt for the microbiome? Or how about just rather than soda? One of the huge things we miss in nutrition is not how good is this, how good is that compared to the thing that you would have otherwise, which is what we've often missed and which is where a lot of the confusion arises. Okay, so that aside, maybe really the tribalism comes to the grains and the meats. Oh, this is where it really gets contentious and we could go to the gluten intolerance and the celiac disease for the grains and we could go to the processed red meat but if you didn't want to have a fight, we could talk steel cut oats and quinoa, and we could talk pasture-raised, antibiotic-free cattle grown in a regenerative agricultural system. It wouldn't be the same fight. So you can pick your fights or not. I really think we agree more than we disagree if we sit down at the table with one another. And let's stop confusing the public so much, which is why I always go back to the wellness letter, because it's always got that vision. And instead of today's science, turns over everything we knew for 50 years. It always says, no, it doesn't. Here's what we knew for 50 years, and here's one new study. And if you put it in context, it makes a big deal or not. I just have loved the way you guys did that. Or you've got your local homegrown guy who just says seven words. OK, there's a ton of merit to that. However, he's got a book with 27 chapters explaining the seven words. So it's not really just as easy as seven words, is it? You can misinterpret anything, and Americans are obsessed with gaming how they could get as much sugar and other things in it and still follow the eat food, not too much, mostly plants. All right. <laughs> or we could go moderation. I hear this so much. Oh, but isn't everything OK in moderation? Can't we have everything? Yeah, but Americans aren't really very good at moderation. So here's how much sugar <laughs> we have compared to the rest of the world. That's not moderation. That's obscene. That's ridiculous. And we just had the red meat debacle. I'm going to go into that for you today, the um, September 30th guidelines that were out there. So the, it said, you know, continue to consume the same amount of red meat. That was bizarre. Why not put some servings in? Because in the US, we eat more red meat in North America than anywhere else in the world, especially if you add pork to that. Oops, I thought I had one more slide. Another talk, I put the pork in there. Uh, so how do you define red meat? It's actually um, beef and pork and lamb. So if you really put the red, the red meat and pork together, the beef and pork, that's really insane compared to the rest. That's not moderation, is it? OK, so moderation doesn't work. And so what we end up with are these horrific headlines. And I'm trying to do a grant or a paper or something, and the media calls me up and said, oh my god, everything we knew is wrong. And no, it's not. I love. Let's walk through this. It really didn't all change. We really know a lot of the same stuff. So, you know, part of the reason it seems so confusing is we isolate stuff. This is one of my favorite quotes. I'm not actually sure if it's accurate. I've heard this can be attributed, but maybe not supposed to be, to John Muir. But the idea is when you take things out of isolation, it messes us all up. Because when you eat anything, you don't eat something else. And you eat it with something else. And you eat it with somebody else. And all of those things have an impact. So I think part of our challenge has been these three domains, nutrients, foods, and food patterns. So if it's nutrients, we figured those out in the early 1900s. But you have to get the nutrients in foods, and then they come with other nutrients and in other packages. And in the end, you kind of want to know whether to be vegetarian or Mediterranean or ketogenic. And that, that's a whole other level of complexity. And so what we tend to do is, we do the more answerable questions in science, which are the more reductionist, isolationist, which is usually nutrients for short terms in a small number of people. And then they say, and that's why you should eat keto or Mediterranean. And that, that's quite a leap. So really, it, it, requires, uh, it requires some going back and forth, in and out, to get a good picture. And it, it really often makes more sense than it appears. So let's just let's take a stab at this, OK? So let's vilify Coke one more time. It's just super easy to vilify. But what if you took the nutrient approach and you made it a better Coke? Yes! 
Did that work? Is that better? Or is it just Coke? Come on. So you can do that with a nutrient approach. You can't really do it with a Mediterranean diet approach. They would never, that would never go over in a Mediterranean world or a ketogenic world or a whole plant-based diet world. So maybe we should go to foods. OK. But even foods are complicated. So we go, uh, I remember the, seeing a, a billboard years ago with eggs getting out of jail. And then they, not only did they get out of jail, but in the last round of the dietary guidelines, they removed the upper limit of dietary cholesterol. And a lot of my colleagues went berserk. Everyone's going to die. There's no upper limit on cholesterol. If you read it, it doesn't just say go hog wild and have eggs all day. It's really, we couldn't justify the 300 milligrams. There really isn't enough data to pick that level as the upper limit. Plus, that's again reducing it to a nutrient in the egg. So I really think that's a horrific false dichotomy that we get stuck on. It really should be better or worse. And it depends on the context. I wish you could move more along those lines. So let me show you some context. Here are cheesy scrambled eggs. That's not just eggs. That's cheesy scrambled eggs. This is cheesy scrambled eggs <laughs> with bacon and sausage. This is a veggie omelet. Mmm. This is not eggs. This is steel-cut oats with fruits and nuts. Oh, my God. Warms my heart. This is just lovely. OK? And this is evil incarnate right here. <sighs> OK. Let me give you some context. Because I think if we had context, we would bicker less. So are eggs good or bad? It's really not an answerable question. Are eggs good or bad with what compared to what? Okay? If we could reframe it that way, we would end some of this endless bickering. So compared to Pop-Tarts, I think all of those egg dishes are better. <laughs> I would rather pick all of them than the Pop-Tarts, even the cheesy eggs with the bacon and sausage. I would. Okay. Did I get? Wait, I saw a lot of heads nodding. Does anybody want to pick the Pop-Tarts over the uh, bacon and cheesy eggs? You might. And the sausage? Maybe. No? OK, at least you're not willing to raise your hand. All right. <laughs> OK, but what about the three egg dishes? So I've been vegan and vegetarian for 35 years. I would definitely go with a veggie omelet. But I'm not sure everybody would. If there's a keto person in here, they might. You know, you can actually have eggs and vegetables, but it depends how many. You don't want to get more than 5% carbs. So they might go with more of the upper eggs. I'm not sure I get complete agreement on this. And I really don't want to get into this tribal war. What about, you know, just no eggs at all, let's go vegan versus, oh my gosh, no, let's go keto or paleo. So I've just started to use Twitter. And boy, are there mean people on Twitter. There's mean, there are mean vegans. There are vegans who are really mean. And so this is just a, a horrific world. So I decided not to go there for the moment. But I want to ask if you would agree these are both whole food plant-based. They are. One is eggs and one is not eggs. They're both whole food plant-based. I kind of like that term. It brings a lot more people under the umbrella. I would go for that. OK, now let's do this exercise. Let's say you just had the steel cut oats every single day of the week, Monday through Saturday. What should you have Sunday? Oh my god, you should have the eggs, damn it. You got, that's not moderation. If you just have steel cut oats every day, that is not moderation. Have the damn eggs, OK? <sighs> what if you had steel cut oats three days and eggs three days? What should you have on Sunday? You can have whatever the hell you want. You can have Pop-Tarts on Sunday. Really? How bad would the Pop-Tarts be if you ate like that six days of the week? Isn't there a little fun in Pop-Tarts? Like, is some childhood memory of, you know, warm feelings of having this disgusting food? Or you could put some other things there. Have some fun. Live on the edge every once in a while. OK. Context, right? So I really hate the false dichotomies that we come up with. Uh, they just seem to be worthless. It's really better or worse. It depends on context. And really, when we pull things out and just by themselves, it doesn't work because if you tug on it, it's connected to everything, which is why I love the wellness letter. They always know how to do that. So I'm just going to keep going back there. OK, but sometimes you've got to step up to the plate, boy, and, 
And last September 30th, just six weeks ago, was one of those times. Oh, my God. Really, haven't we gone beyond this? So this is a bizarre thing. There were six articles in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Six. Who publishes six altogether? That's a, let's deal with that later. Like, I don't know how you get six published at once. Did they submit 12 and they only got six accepted? That's like my biggest question. Like, is it a contract? If six is a bunch, you got to take them all? So the media went back and forth, and Gina Collada bought into it, and Alison Aubrey didn't buy into it, and a lot of us were writing rebuttals, and it pretty much sucked all the oxygen out of life for me personally that week. Okay. I've been teaching human nutrition at Stanford for 18 years, and actually a couple of students I think I saw in here, so thanks for showing up tonight. They seem to be spreading in different places. Every year I start the class, I start with, we're going to go over nutrition, and we got to talk about what we know and how we know it. And there's a lot of ways to find out. And we usually don't have perfect evidence, but let's use all the tools we have. And sometimes it's cell and molecular biology for mechanism. Sometimes it's in a whole animal model. It's often observational epidemiology, which tends to be association, but not causation. But there's a lot of great things you can do with epi. And there's some folks doing fabulously innovative things with epi. You can do a lot of feed them and bleed them trials. This is what I call myself, a feeder and a bleeder. I'll get people for 6 to 12 months, and I'll get them to eat differently, and I'll draw blood, and we'll publish papers. Great. Or, or there's let's randomly assign people for 10 to 20 years and see who lives or dies. And we just, that just doesn't happen very much. It really doesn't happen with red meat. That's nuts. Who would sign up for that? I agree to do either or. I'll either have none or I'll have a lot for the next 20 years just Christopher, you're curious? Great, I'll do it for you, because you're curious. No, they won't. They won't sign up for that. <sighs> OK, so here's this group. Of the six papers they published, one of them had the headline of being a clinical guideline. OK, I tried to help you here. They want you to, as a clinical guideline, continue your current amount of unprocessed meat, continue your current amount of processed meat based on Weak recommendation with low certainty evidence. Wow, I'm just compelled. So that's, I really had to scratch my head on that one. Like, really? That you did a ton of work and got six papers published? That's, that's the clinical guideline. You know, I, I work with a lot of people, and across all these groups, we've been saying limit, lower. For, for years, a lot of really bright people from multiple disciplines. So who are you? Anyway, what? What clinical guideline group are you? I don't really know your name. And um, this is the official journal of the ACP, the American uh, Cardio College of Physicians. College, that's what C is for. Imagine College. Of we actually called the, the head of that and said, are these your guidelines? No, these aren't our guidelines, but they pu got published in annals. And I really felt like that Butch Cassidy movie. How many of you were old enough to remember? There were these guys chasing Butch and Sundance, and they just they couldn't figure out who the heck was chasing them. I really feel like, where did these guys come up with? Well, it turns out the lead is in McMaster University in Canada and created their own nutrition recommendation group called Nutrirex, and they developed their own rigorous systematic review for grading evidence. So these guidelines actually don't reflect any new data at all. They reflect uh, somebody's new algorithm of how to approach different types of evidence. So they really believe in the randomized controlled trial with life or death as an outcome. OK, good luck, because in nutrition, that just doesn't happen very often. So they uh, found 12 trials. I was surprised they found 12, actually. Um, oddly enough, uh, they found the Leon Hart study, which isn't a red meat reduction trial, but it involved red meat reduction. And they negated it for a reason I don't want to go into now, but I can on the chairs if you ask me later. They didn't include Predimed, which is a super famous study that included some red meat reduction. So that was really bizarre. And they said the only one we found that worked is the Women's Health Initiative, which is just bizarre because that was a low fat study. It wasn't a red meat lowering study. And so they said, we really have faith in randomized controlled trials. And we found 12, of which we only believe in one. And the one found nothing. And so apparently, there's no evidence that you should lower your red meat. It was really, that was really odd. And they said, but we are, we are willing to consider some risk factor studies 
Now, oddly, they had a six-month cutoff for the trials, at least six months. And I write studies that I can't get funded if they're too long because it doesn't seem worth it. And you can lower cholesterol and blood pressure in weeks or months. So six months means you cut out a whole lot of trials that were shorter than that. So they, they really only got a small subset of trials that are out there. But I, I don't really know how many focused on red meat. I, I don't think I could find that many. So I, I was surprised they found this many. I looked and quite a few of the 11 that were left were funded by meat folks. But this is, this is the line that really got me. I'm sorry, this is really petty of me to pick on this. But they said of the 11 studies, they proved to be at high risk of bias due to a lack of blinding. Let me think about this for a minute. They wanted to randomly assign people to red meat or not and not tell them? How do you, how does that work? I think, my, I guess my impression, I'm sorry to be petty here, but it's like they're really good at math but they don't eat food because you can't <laughs> blind people about red meat or sugar, anything like You'll never blind those trials. So if that's their criteria, which is very rigorous and applies well to a drug trial, should be randomized, double blind, placebo controlled, and the blinding should work. Well, OK, so they wrote off all the randomized trials. And they have three separate papers on observational epidemiology, three. However, in their bylines, they say, we don't believe observational epidemiology. So I don't know why they did three separate papers on it, because then they immediately said, we found the same findings that all the other groups have for the last 20 years, but we think it's association, not causation. I, I, I take that back. It is association, not causation, and we don't think that's enough. So we negate that. Eh, those don't count. OK, but they got nothing left. So what I was really disappointed in because I really feel like the Harvard folks have done some fabulous stuff in this area. And it, it is observational epi, but you can be innovative in that field. You're not just observing. So one of the things that Frank Koo and Walter Willett have been doing is they've got 20 or 30 years of tracking people. They have tens of thousands of nurses and health professionals who have lived or died. And they collect diet data every four years. And so they've developed a new method where they're actually looking at change in diet over four years. So I know it's observational epi, and so I, I really thought this was clever. So one thing you could do is you could take every four years and average them and say, now I have a better assessment of aggregate exposure over time. That would be one way. But they're taking it a different way. They say every four years there's a small percentage of people who change, and we're actually going to look at the change as a predictor of outcome. And when we look at change and we look at what they swapped it out for. Did they swap it out? They didn't have red meat. They had nuts or beans and legumes or dairy, whole grains, poultry, or fish. And these are all hazard ratios. So that dotted red line on the right is a null finding. And everything higher than one would be increased risk and lower would be a lower risk. So it's the same data as we've always found. If you lower your red meat, you lower your risk of mortality. But this is pretty clever, because it looked at how do you lower it? Not just lower it, but what do you swap out instead? And they looked separately at unprocessed and processed and combined them. This, to me, is some really innovative observational epidemiology. This isn't just straightforward, old, old school stuff. So I don't know, those, those other guys, the, Mc, the McMaster University guys, they said they were super smart, and they had this whole new way to grade evidence. And they they kind of blew off the, all this innovation that's going in observational epidemiology and just dismissed it because it's association, not causation. But they don't have randomized trials. So you know, the big part is if you eat more meat, there's less room on the plate for other things. And if you take some off, there's more room on the plate for veggies and grains and other things. So <sighs> they admittedly didn't deal with animal welfare or the environment. And this was a line that came out of the editorial they went with this, and I think that's a big part of it too, and I will talk about that later. So at the end of the day, I just, this just sucked all the oxygen out of life for me and, and about six of my friends as we tried to deal with all the media calling about this. Is it really different? Did, it, did all the evidence change? And we said, no, plus I'm, I'm really upset with this current level. I mean, the current level is really high. If India and China try to copy us, we're really extra screwed environmentally. If they all try to catch up to our level, oh, I hope our level is a lot lower. So anybody aspires to that is picking something, dare I say, more moderate. So 
right? We've got pictures now of the Amazon burning because China is buying land in Brazil so that they can grow corn and soy or graze their cattle so that they can raise their red meat consumption. This is huge. This sounds dangerous. This sounds really irresponsible to say continue eating current levels. It's not a very broad approach. It's a very narrow focused approach. So they say they have weak recommendations as low certainty of evidence. I agree. Eh, I'm dinging these guys. There are no new data here. This is sort of a self-proclaimed group posing, uh, proposing their own guidelines using their own criteria, which they're allowed to do, and we are allowed to rebut them. And we have been trying really hard. So that would be my rebuttal to this, is that the, the picture they tried to paint was too small. And I had a chance to do this on forums. So if anybody wants to hear me rant even more, I got to work with Michael Krasny on it. It was really fun. Plus, I'm learning a tweet. I did a 17-thread tweet post. I got 100,000 impressions, whatever that means. And so uh, you can follow me on Twitter and look at my thread of the response to this. And uh, I haven't seen the Berkeley Wellness Letter. I'm assuming that's coming out sometime soon. Yeah. OK, but the Harvard School of Public Health did the nutrition source really quickly. So there's some other things you can do. So, so back to sort of this pieces of the puzzle thing, right? I, I, there's lots of different kinds of evidence. And just because you're missing that one kind doesn't mean you don't have any. Actually, uh, a colleague named David Katz has said, you know, lifestyle medicine requires a different set of criteria. We rarely have randomized double-blind controlled trials of life or death. And let's take advantage of all the data that we do have. So he's created a whole other set of guidelines that would take advantage of the type of data that we do have, which I really like. OK, at the end, let's just do a thought experiment here. Let's, so let's say I got to be food czar for the day, and I get the entire NIH budget. And I say, you're right, we really do need the human trials. So we'll have to define red meat, choose a dose, pick a replacement, pick an outcome, and pick a population. OK, you ready? I got the whole NIH budget. I'm going to go with beef, two to six ounces, replace it with beans, heart disease, and heart attack survivors. 20 years later, I finish, and somebody says, what about bacon? I said, oh, yeah, shoot, bacon. OK, another one. <laughs> no, 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 no. I meant bacon at zero versus four ounces. Oh, yeah, I didn't answer that one. OK, wait. OK, I'll design another one. Yeah, but I wanted them to replace it with fish. OK, I don't know the answer to that one either. OK, and I wanted this in cancer and cancer. Oh, you're right, I didn't do that either. So this whole idea that a randomized trial is the answer to everything in nutrition doesn't work. You can't do a trial that has all the doses, all the people, all the conditions, et cetera, which is the beauty of observational epidemiology. You could be looking at who did it in different ways and who started at a different place and who had a different outcome. It isn't the end-all, be-all, but it's a great source of data not to dismiss. So I'm really not too upset that we don't have those data. I think we have great data. And when I hang out with people who are making guidelines and we're talking about available evidence, we pretty much come to the same consensus every time. It's really reassuring. It doesn't sound like it in the media, but it's really reassuring. It does sound like it if you read the Berkeley Wellness Letter, because they always get it right. So I love it. So I will delve a little into this new direction I think we need to move, because I'm tired of answering the old questions. I think we answered them. They're really not going to change unless we do get those randomized trials. So I, I think it's time to do some new kinds of science. And a, a paradigm shift in my mind would be this switch from health to stealth. So for 10 years now, I've been teaching a class called Food and Society. And I think at least one of my ex-students is in the audience somewhere here today. Um, this is because that pediatrician and I were getting really frustrated that uh, our trials weren't changing behavior. We were doing good science, but we weren't changing behavior. And we said, let's get rid of all the science. Let's just read Michael Pollan and Jonathan Safran Foer and Marianne Nessel, and let's talk about societal issues, not health issues, right? And so we had them read books. We had them watch documentaries. There's no quizzes, midterms, or final exams. You had to try to write an op-ed and get it published about whichever topic you were most irate about. Um, you didn't have to get it published to get a grade. That was fair. But you did have to try three times to get it published. And they made YouTubes with their peers for behavior change, and you had them blogging. And we collected pre-post data on this. And we had a comparison class. Actually, we had three comparison classes. And in the end, 
we published this in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine saying, you know, we actually recorded that these students said they ate better without ever talking about health, only talking about other issues. And it's science, because we had a graph, and we had <laughs> error bars. And we got an aggregate composite score, and we have a p-value, and it is statistically significant. This is a terrible study, right? Are you all rolling? How, not enough of you are rolling your eyes right now. Are you kidding me? This was self-selected. They wrote their name on the pre and the post. I'm sure they wanted a good grade, so they said, I wonder if Professor Gardner will give me a better grade if I say I ate more vegetables and less red meat. Oh, there, there are so many things wrong with this study. Why did they publish it? We actually put all those caveats in the paper, and I think they took it because this is a shift. This is a different way of looking at it. I think they really took it more for the shift in approach than the rigorous science. This is sort of a paradigm shift in the way we might think about framing behavior change. I actually know that um, somebody did their dissertation trying to replicate our, our study. Uh, I know multiple universities that have taken our syllabus and tried to implement it there. I've had a lot of love over this study. It, it's a terrible study from a scientifically rigorous point of view. But it's really one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. At the end of the first year of class, sort of wondering, wow, this is really fun. I think I want to teach this again, but I want to make sure I teach the best readings and maybe get rid of some. So I kind of asked around the room, what did you like the most or the least? And let's just share really quickly. And the, the first woman in the class, sort of a tear streaming down her eyes, said the whole vegetarian thing really got me. And the animal rights, I've gone vegetarian. And the, the kid next to her said, I grew up on a ranch. We never... We never treated our animals like that. We treated them really well. Um, but wow, that global warming thing and the, the tie to methane, that really got me. So I'm really only eating grass-fed, pasture-raised animal products now. And then that kid next to them said, well, I'm from sort of a more conservative background. I think climate change is a hoax. But I did read the thing about the fast food places being uh, getting small business loans from uh, the government because McDonald's doesn't really make money off the hamburgers. They make money off the real estate, as it was described in this book. And so they rent, and the franchise owner gets a small business loan. And there was an example of 13 Wendy's that got opened up, and 10 went out of business. Many small business loans didn't get paid back, but McDon Wendy's didn't lose any money. They still own the property. And this person was irate, said, I, I have stopped eating fast food. And I said, <laughs> OK, wait a sec. This is super cool. You're a vegetarian, and you're only eating pasture-raised, grass-fed, and you don't eat fast food anymore. And I didn't talk about health once this whole time. <coughs> and the other thing that I really liked was there was no single topic in the class that resonated with everyone. There were different topics that resonated with different people. But they all kind of led to the same thing, right? So in this day and age when we have, if I can loosely interpret Michael's book as being unprecedented food choices, that's the dilemma, uh, for decades, I gave hour-long, pretty boring talks on sort of basic nutrient stuff. And a lot of what I've done now is shift the focus of some of my talks <coughs> along the lines of what I just said for stealth nutrition. And the huge satisfaction I get out of this is people start eating in a better way without talking about health. They're aligned. If you eat in alignment with social justice, animal rights, and welfare, and climate change, you eat a healthier diet. But there isn't any one thing that hooks everybody. You have to have multiple tools in your tool chest. So I've just really been impressed that these external motivators, these societal issues, will probably lead most people to better behavior change. And then instead of, OK, there's a salad and a cookie, and I know the cookie's not so good, but it's only me. So today I'm going to have the cookie, and tomorrow I'll have the salad. No, we actually get the students thinking, it's not just me. When I have that, I'm perpetuating a broken food system. You're right, I'm really going to have the better choice, because it isn't just me. So another real huge change in the work that I've been doing lately was completely influenced by this guy, Greg Drescher, who was really interested in elevating the unapologetic deliciousness of food. And I said, it, it sounds cool. I don't really understand the unapologetic part. And he says, yes, you do. You're a health professional. Here's what you do as a health professional. I know you want to eat that gooby, icky thing. I have a piece of cardboard that's really high in fiber. 
and it's really good for you. Do you see my face scrunching up? I'm really sorry that I'm asking you to give up the goopy, gooey thing that you like for the cardboard that has a lot of fiber that will lower your LDL. Come on, we're like apologizing. We've created this false dichotomy between health and taste. And what he wanted to bring back to this is that really healthy tasting food can be, sorry, really healthy food can be uh, unapologetically delicious. Don't apologize anymore. Thrive on it. Make it craveable. Bring it back together. I thought that was brilliant because I thought we've been screwing up on that for years. So sort of built off of this idea of the menus of change where we've developed a whole bunch of principles. Um, and the whole idea is to hit this sweet spot in the middle where it's nutritious and delicious at the bottom and environmentally sustainable on the left and socially just on the right. Wow, that sounded way more aspirational. I really like that idea. So the Menus of Change group, I was on the scientific advisory board and there was a business board and there was a chef board and the idea was to generate principles. So the 12 principles on the left in this infographic are operational principles and the 12 principles on the right are nutrition principles. And so this has to do with institutional food and Berkeley is one of our members, Berkeley Dining Hall, uh, actually, all the, all the UCs are part of this thing that we've started where we're trying to focus on dining halls as living laboratories in universities. And we're trying to get students to shift their impressions and behaviors along the lines of this unapologetic deliciousness. And one of the single themes that ties a lot of the principles together has been the protein flip. And so the protein flip actually started out for the culinary folks as the dessert flip. They were getting a hard time for all the sugar and desserts. And they said, you remember that big piece of cheesecake you had with a raspberry on top? How about a bowl of raspberries with a dollop of cheesecake on top? And when the patron says, where's my cheesecake? You say, I didn't take it away. It's still there. It's on top, just like the berry was before. And so just like that dessert flip... They said, how about instead of a big piece of flesh in the middle of the plate, and how about instead of the vegetarian menu and the carnivore menu at the restaurant, you find something in the middle for people. You have a global fusion of flavors. You have ancient grains with some beluga lentils with some seared vegetables and strips of beef or chicken or something. And it's plant-based, and it's a lot less meat, but it's not this tribalism. It's not the vegan versus non-vegan. So... I love this less meat, better meat, protein flip idea. Plus, they make it look great, taste great, and sound great. So we've actually had uh, at Stanford our uh, senior associate in charge of residential and dining enterprises and our head dining guy have helped us create the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, where we actually now have 60 universities on board. A single university will pilot a project and then make it available to the other cadre of universities. And if they want to replicate it, then they can. And then we can publish something that's more generalizable. So we have a whole website with a whole set of research on that. We have a teaching kitchen that we're moving forward. And just last month in Psych Science, the top psychological journal, we published our first multi-site trial. OK, and this all had to do with indulgent tasting vegetables. It was a really simple dining hall level study, piloted at Stanford. During one quarter, they serve about 17 vegetables over the course of the quarter on a rotating basis. They came up with four different names for each vegetable. One was basic, one was absence of vilified, one was presence of glorified, and one was indulgent. And as a quick example, carrots, low sodium carrots, absence of vilified, high fiber carrots, presence of glorified, or twisted citrus glazed carrots. <laughs> indulgent. The key was the recipe never changed. Only the sign changed. They ate 25% more vegetables when we used an indulgent name. We actually worked with a linguist at Stanford who helped us come up with the terms. Five universities replicated it. And at the end, this is the table that's in Psych Science that just came out last month. What was really fascinating is the health-focused labels fared worse than basic. If you said it was carrots versus low sodium or high fiber, low sodium and high fiber did worse. It's like, oh, I know the healthy stuff tastes worse. I'll just have the basic carrots. <laughs> no, it's the same recipe. It's just a name. 
Anyway, we were having a blast using these young people and their innovation, and the dining operators are welcoming us in the dining halls, and we're all out for better satisfaction from the students, better health, better taste, better environmental sustainability all around. So, how am I doing? Oh, I'm nailing this. Okay, I'll, I'll be at 40 minutes. I got, I got two minutes left. Ready? So, I got my PhD in Morgan Hall right there studying health in nutrition science. Okay, so being practical and realistic after now, that was uh, in 93, so you know, don't count those years. That was a lot of years. What I'm up against is taste, cost, and convenience, and that makes total sense. The reality check is I told you to eat this because it was healthy, and they said, yeah, but that one costs less. It's more convenient and it tastes better. Dang it. Okay, all right, that's tough. All right, I could be more professional about this and say, okay, but I got bazillions of dollars from the NIH and I randomized people. I did this fabulous science to make it even more compelling. But then the food industry steps in with some disinformation. There's a lot of food politics of, of who's making which guidelines and policies. And then clearly journalism and clickbait stuff is going on that's messing me up. So thank God again for the Wellness Center, which is always an inspiration because I don't want to go there. I don't want to fight that practical battle, that professional battle. What I'm really after, and I think the, the Wellness Center is giving me a stepping stone to this, is way more aspirational. Actually, we know enough right now to make healthy food that tastes great, that's environmentally sustainable, and there's social justice involved. And I can tell you that the Gen Zers in these universities are all over this. They love the social justice aspect, and they're terrified about the environmental sustainability aspects. So I think as we start training young adults before they have kids and before they start companies or work in companies, I think we should be aspirational about hitting this part in the middle. And, and I really think we need to move beyond the old kind of studies we've been doing. We need to do new kinds of science around nutrition to get the behavior change. So my goal is to change social norms and make that default choice unapologetically delicious. And in your back pocket, have the nutrition and the environmental sustainability, but lead with taste. So I get to acknowledge a whole bunch of fabulous people at Stanford who work with me. Uh, it, just, it just keeps mounting the number of disciplines that I get to work with. Uh, my 40 minutes is up, so I'm not going to let you look long in there. I've got a farmer in there. I've got a chef. i got psych, immunology. Uh, ah, i got so many folks. That was, what I, that was a narrative I, I wanted to share with you tonight, and I'm anxious to talk with John, and I, I'm just going to feed your soul here. We could talk about low-fat, low-carb diets. That was our big JAMA paper. And I just I want to shout out the Wellness Letter for calling this a stellar study. And then, this is what's great. Look at the end of what they said. They did a good study, but what we still don't know is this, 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 and this. That study didn't answer all the questions. I love that. I didn't feel shamed or called out. I really love it that you said, wow, good study. It really doesn't answer everything, Christopher. There's a long way to go. I get that. I get that. <laughs> so we've also done a, a really nice paper on um, protein. And so vegetarian versus animal, things like that. I was responsible for um, uh, artificial sweetener statement by the American Heart Association. We're currently running a ketogenic versus Mediterranean diet study, which should be a lot of fun. And we're currently doing one of the alt meats versus red meat in 35 people in a crossover. So I do still feed and bleed people for a living, but I'm really much more interested in moving the needle in behavior. And uh, I, I'm anxious to, to sit with John and maybe have a conversation about some of that. Thank you. Questions for Christopher? I tried to feed you some seating there, sure. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, so my, my question was, um, you know, how do you think, I guess, um, Maybe insurance companies or other institutions in huh. healthcare can help incentivize uh, this shift towards uh, more uh, healthy nutritional choices and just overall focusing more on preventative uh, lifestyle. Wow, that's great. So uh, health insurance and other organizations that would support these efforts. I see a lot of this in work sites. 
Um, I think one of the challenges is, so Stanford has a program like this. They have a Be Well program, and you actually get money back in your paycheck if you participate in more health-oriented things. I have to say it's been quite a challenge to show data that this works. So if it's students, they're not around long enough to see if they got heart disease or uh, cancer. And in the, um, we actually have a separate program for the uh, 14,000 staff, faculty and staff, and we have no control group. So we have a pretty select population signing up for this stuff. So I'm really interested in finding people who have clever ways of, of doing some data matching. Like, how would you match that to see if the program was working? I mean, the, intuitively, you would save money. Everybody would win. Uh, I think a challenge is coming up with a clever design so that you can show that it wasn't just a secular effect or a self-selected group. So uh, I need help. So if you want to work on that, I'm ready. What, Chris, go ahead. What about what Kaiser's doing? Somebody... And I don't know what Kaiser's doing, so go ahead and. Sorry. <laughs> well, they have. Um, I don't have the mic, but it's fine. They have. Um... I got another one for you. It's okay. <clears throat> Maybe. The light's not on. They're, they're peri periodically, they have um, farmers markets for the public. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Ky the incentive, of course, is to keep their population. Healthy. Yes. So, and they're thrived that whole campaign. What insurance could do, I think insurance could do a lot more. I mean, there is a group that actually funded the Dean Ornish program at one point after some evidence was there. So I actually think what we need are some models where people are trying that to see what kind of behavior change you get and, and what kind of outcomes, what sample size do you need, and how long do you got to follow people. I, I think it's coming. People are experimenting with it. Yes? I probably done the same. Like, just not Kaiser, but I have personally dealt with Blue Shield. They have worksite wellness programs, and that's how they collect data. So depending on the wellness programs, each facility or a school, or depending on the group, they are intensifying with help of insurance companies. And that's how I think the employee health slash, you know, you're talking college. But there are programs out there, but as you said, the data, they don't really have a data in the report, the study which comes out. But there are strategies like Kaiser and Bushi they are adopting. So I will say there does seem to be more and more interest in prevention now, just as a reality check. Like if we don't do the pre prevention, the whole healthcare system's going to be crippled. I, I think we have the wake-up call. Yes, and then here. Hi, I'm Peggy. I teach adults living with disability a healthy cooking class. Ah, oh, fabulous. Yes, and I wanted to know if you knew of any organizations that have come to nonprofits and given cooking um, lessons, if you will, on healthier alternatives making foods. Okay, uh, you got a, a teaching kitchen for some disabled adults, and so the one thing that'll offer you is a resource. So I, I just finished working with uh, a postdoc who's now uh, in more of a clinical role, but she's a Harvard-trained physician and a cordon bleu-trained chef. <laughs> and through the American College in Lifestyle Medicine, she has published a 300-page manual on culinary medicine. And so it is full of recipes. It's not um, iron chef cooking, it's really basic cooking, right? Yeah, so one of the ideas is to um, just get people some basic culinary skills, picking some healthier choices. And then the, um, the other idea as a resource is uh, David Eisenberg has started a Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. So if you look for TKC, Teaching Kitchen Collaborative, and this is fascinating because this is as simple as a roll-up cart that's a pop-out to a $2 million teaching kitchen with all the bells and whistles and photography. So they're actually ready to put a teaching kitchen up anywhere for anybody, and, and they're compiling recipes and things like that. So I think you would have a lot to share and look at from the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. Yeah, and if anybody wants any follow-up questions, C. Gardner at Stanford. Sorry, I don't have a Cal thing anymore. C. Gardner <laughs> at Stanford.edu. Yeah, what, what can you say about uh, individual differences in nutrition? Oh, Particularly yes. as people age. I mean, oh, yeah? do you have anything to say about supplements uh, in, in terms of the you know, <laughs> Okay, the question's getting bigger and bigger here. <laughs> uh, I'll just do supplements first. That was part of the question. You should be able to get all your nutrients from food. Not everybody can. Not everybody has access. Access to healthy food all the time. Um, if you, so you could hedge your bets and get a multivitamin, multimineral. 
I'm, I'm not sure about other things at the moment, but the personalized thing. So this is a really hot time for personalization. Tons of companies are starting and flailing. They're, they, they're saying too quickly that they can tell you. Send us your poop and we'll tell you if you're a forager or a forester. No, they won't. They won't. And Habit, I, I don't know if Habit is still around, and uh, Iredale and a couple other ones. Uh, they've come and gone. They really, they're ahead of the science. So I'm going to refer back to the study that John mentioned. So I think we did a really nice study. And I want to give it a shout out to Mandy, who's in the back. But maybe she left with her child. There she still is. So she helped run uh, the study. She can even vouch for this. Uh, we try to be completely agnostic and teach people a healthy low carb and a healthy low fat. And we try to help them lose weight. And after uh, 12 months, collectively, they lost 6,000 pounds. And the average was virtually identical. But within both groups, there was an 80-pound range of different response. So somebody in both groups lost 60. Somebody gained 20. And I made what's called a waterfall plot, where I put everybody's uh, result next to the other one. So it's a continuum. Those weren't outliers. The losing 60 and the gaining 20, those were not outliers. It was everything in between. And so kind of the way we interpreted the study, we were actually looking for a genotype marker that didn't work and a metabolic marker that didn't work. We had two main hypotheses that didn't help predict that variability. But what we're learning is there's a massive amount of variability. And so what we're thinking is this foundational diet is more veggies, more whole foods, less added sugar, less refined grain, less processed food. But after that, people definitely vary. And so uh, the quick example that I've given in the past is sort of my eggs and uh, steel cut oats thing. I bet if I got a bunch of you to sign up for doing those two breakfasts, one after the other, that a bunch of you would be super filled up by the steel cut oats and would be satiated for quite a while. Some of you would be hungry an hour later. Say, so that is not enough. And then when you did the cheesy eggs, I'm going to bet some of you will say, I'm not sure if I can finish this dish. It's so high in calories and it's so dense. Um, I'm just going to eat three quarters. And some others of you would say, can I please have seconds? Because I'm not full yet and that was super yummy. And so what I'm really fascinated about are um, personalization issues for satiety. And the, the coolest topic that we're working on now is the microbiome. So everybody in our studies not only bleeds for us, they poop for us now. <laughs> and Justin and Erica Sonnenberg characterize their microbiome. And we're really seeing some uh, differential personal responses to the same meal based on the microbiome. So there is definitely personalization. But my plea is there's a bunch of foundational stuff everybody agrees on. So don't do the fringe things first. Do the foundational things first. And if you have that down, then biohack your cheesy eggs versus your steel-cut oats and see what works for you. Because there's a lot of whole food, plant-based things that contain some meat and fish and chicken that, that would be fine for different people. OK, now i got a lot of him. Christopher, wanna... we loved that study. I can't tell you what we, we so enjoyed writing it up and thinking about it. it was I was so study. Thank you. I was honored. OK, okay go ahead. Um, so when you say biohacking, choosing between oatmeal and cheesy eggs, what are you talking about? I know about heart rate variability, measuring that and seeing how your body does. Personally, but what else? So, all right, so the, the high tech tools we have could be some monitors like that. We've got continuous glucose monitors now. We're slapping these on people and they love them. I thought they'd be a pain in the butt. They love them. But also, <clears throat> how satiated are you? How much energy do you have at the end of the day? There's some really simple stuff that if we listen to our body, you'd say, oh my God, I'm in a food coma right now versus, wow. The fog is cleared, and I'm really feeling crisp, and I'm feeling creative. So we're actually, we've created something at Stanford called the Well Registry. And we're trying to shift from risk factors like cholesterol and blood pressure to resilience and uh, uh, grit and creativity. And so we have metrics of those, too. And so one of our thoughts is the thing that will be more motivating for a substantial change and a lasting change is something that makes you feel better tomorrow. And I don't think you need a continuous glucose monitor or a heart rate for some of that. You just see how you feel. We sort of lost this sense of body with all the stuff that's going on. So my biohacking would partly involve just common sense. How do you feel? There, oh my god, there, there, there. Okay, we'll do three in a row. 
All right. The, uh, I had a question from way back. You haven't mentioned fasting or intermittent fasting. Ah. That's my question. Okay. The last thing that came to mind when you're talking about poop is how about poop transplant? Yeah. Okay, the poop transplants, that's for C. diff, that's absolutely fabulous. I think beyond that, I'm not ready to go there yet. Um, so the intermittent fasting, I'm sorry, I'm going to make short shrift of this. I had a postdoc who published a paper in it. There isn't one way to intermittent fast. There's 10. There's either eat less five days of the month than normal for 25 days. There's eat fast every other day. There's fast for three days. There's only eat between 12 and 6 p.m. So that... that uh, topic is taking off, but nobody's really doing it in a standard way. And so the postdoc that we had that did this trial did a six-month trial, and the, the design seems kind of elegant to me. They were overweight, and so one group was assigned to eat 75% of the calories that they needed every day, so they were hungry. They're eating 25% less. And the other group, this was their definition, was supposed to eat 100% of what they needed, and then 50, and 100, and 50, and 100, and 50 which averages to 75. It's just a different way of eating the same number of calories. They were both a calorie deficit, and they both got exactly the same results at the end. And I saw the reviewer comments, and the reviewer said, how do you know they even did it? He said, well, that's a good point. <laughs> Maybe the 150, 150 was really doing 90, 60, 90, 60, and the 75, 75 was so annoyed they got that that they did 80, 70, 80, 70. And so it wasn't really the difference that they thought they had, and they, they couldn't show it. That's really a hard thing to track. You have to track all those people day after day accurately. So my answer to the intermittent fasting is, I think for some people it's a rule. And Americans get so confused sometimes, and it's a simple rule. I only eat 12 to 6, and if it's after or before I don't eat, they get that, and it works. I don't actually think it's a healthy way to eat. I just think it works for some people because it's a rule, but I don't have any data to refute or support it. Um, I was hoping to uh, get more information about like effect modification of physical activity and the variance of physical activity with nutrition. I wonder if you could speak to that. So, we did, so in the big weight loss study that we did, uh, everybody was told to exercise, and very few people exercised more. The whole focus was on food. We did have somebody who lost one of the 60-pound losers, trained for and ran a marathon. They totally exercised more. A lot of people never left the couch. They were overweight to begin with, and they stayed on the couch, and they were sedentary. It, that's a huge covariate. And yes, it would be an effect modifier, but I think more interestingly is who is more likely to be physically active? And which, so I don't think we can assign it and just see what happens. I'm really curious to see the ones who just do it naturally. So part of it is it could be an effect modifier if you could get them to change their behavior. But would you agree there's another potential for an effect modifier where they're just innately more physically active versus less? And that's part of the effect modification. And in that case, I'm not changing their behavior. I'm just learning something about their innate physiology. I'd actually want to tease those two apart. Does that make sense? That's probably a totally unsatisfying answer, but yeah, quick follow-up. You're going from planet fitness to like CrossFit, that's like a huge, <coughs> I would say, probably a synergistic effect. So, yeah, so I'm definitely a nutrition scientist, so the question was CrossFit versus the other thing that you said, which was a planet fitness. Planet fitness yeah, like yeah, whatever that, there's so many different ways to be physically active. Um, I think that behavior change is just as hard, and that's not my field, so I'm going to bow out for the physical activity side. Certainly an effect modifier. You can get anybody to be more physically active. It's going to help. Most people aren't, just like most people aren't cleaning up their diet. Yes? Yeah, uh, one of the really unexplored areas of nutrition seems to be in the use of spices. Oh, so many spices. Lovely. Turmeric and cheese yeah. and cayenne and ginger and cinnamon can be more nutritious maybe than the food itself. And, you know, I'm wondering if there's a way to explore this because, you know, there's such a rich body of these super sources of nutrients. Yep. So I'm going to push back and challenge you a little on that. I, at home right now, I have gypsy soup. Gypsy soup is one of my go-tos. In fact, my wife often gives me a hard time, oh, God, gypsy soup again, okay? And one of the beauties is it's got turmeric in it and a bunch of other spices, and it just glows with the turmeric. 
And uh, I put in uh, two tablespoons, and I make a triple batch, and I eat a few bowls uh, every other month or so. I don't put turmeric in a whole lot of other things. I don't think I eat enough turmeric for it to help me. Um, so one of the issues with the spices is how much can you eat? And one of my fears is people are going to buy the turmeric capsule. And what I'd really have them not do is think, to get the dose I need to get the effect from the curcumin, I need the supplement. No, you don't. You need to eat better tasting food. And with a little bit of culinary skills, you could be eating gypsy soup and put turmeric in that and ginger in that and another herb in that. And it would just be part of your repertoire of cooking. So I do think there's room for spices. It's really hard to quantify a health effect given the small amount of dose you'd get by the time you ate the meal unless you get the supplement. And the supplement thing terrifies me that they won't eat food. Sorry. But by the way, that, that curry, which has the turmeric and the black pepper in it, which, you know, increases the availability of the turmeric. Yeah. That's the sort of issue. There's some cool things. It's hard to study. Like, you're not going to see who lives or dies. You could pick lipids or blood pressure. You could. I'm just afraid to do it and get it published. Somebody would do it in a pill. But if, if you could just eat more vegetables that way, that'd be my stealth nutrition. This is a curcumin study. And uh, in order to get the curcumin, you're going to have to eat a whole lot of vegetables. And that I would win right there. We got some over there. OK. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, let's get a woman. Way in the back. Woman. Yes, gender balance. Um, so I'm in med school, and something I struggle with nutrition in med school a lot. You don't learn a lot of it. I know. Um, We're working on it. Two of my big questions are one around um, cholesterol and statins. I often feel like our only response to high cholesterol is or LDL, HDL, is statins. And for a lot of people, statins don't work. And so I was wondering if don't work the body. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about statins versus responding to the nutrition. And then my other big question is the measures that we have for health and eating. There's a lot of pushback against the <coughs> and using weight even as a measure of health. And so I'm wondering sort of if there's two big topics. BMI and LDL cholesterol. BMI is not a great metric. Yeah. True, yep. So it's BMI, and, so that's what I'm trying to repeat. BMI, body mass index, is a metric of health. Yeah, but it's a really simple public health tool. It doesn't require anything but stepping on a scale. Um, the other ones are more invasive and take longer, so I, I don't think we can address that right now. Um, the statin, I'm a nutritionist, not a physician, so I'm going to have John help me out. LDL is only one risk factor. There's 20 risk factors. There's plenty of people with high LDL that never have a heart attack and low <coughs> LDL that do. Uh, if you want a nutrition approach to LDL as an alternative to statins, David Jenkins did a really cool um, eco study where he combined, and I'm sure you guys covered this, I'm sure he had fiber and soy phytoestrogens and, made, and something else. He like put three things together, and he matched the effect of a low-dose statin in an old JAMA paper was sort of a triple attack. He had three nutritional approaches to lower LDL, and combined it worked as well as a low-dose statin. So yeah, we, you can do that with diet, but you have to get adherence, and you have to get those doses. So, Plus, by the way, we are working on nutrition in medical school. We are. I know we desperately need it. Anybody in charge of board exams here? Because what we really need is if there's more nutrition questions on the board exams, they will have more nutrition in med school. That's really what I think we need. Uh huh. My question is actually also to follow up that. So, what do you think the role of the physician should be when it comes to advising patients on the nutrition? Uh -huh. On one hand, it's foundation for health. Yep. On the other hand, you get the training. So, so this time the question is, what's the role of the physician? Um, it, I think this also depends on specialty. So, family medicine and internists and general practitioners. I think that needs to be a core of what they learn. So we actually, I get four hours of Stanford med students in their entire career, four. And I fly through stuff. And this last time uh, that we taught, we actually changed the way we um, structured the classes. For two of the four, we brought in teams of dietitians as their professional colleagues. We said, these folks study nutrition. And so we shared some case studies, and we planted a dietitian at each table and said, this is who you should turn to as your colleague. Um, I actually love beyond, beyond the nutrition side. I think physicians need to cook more and take better care of themselves so that they can 
say, this is what I made last night. Would you like to know what I made last night? Um, another role for physicians that we have going on right now. So Michelle Hauser, this amazing Cordon Bleu trained chef, uh, is working on a food pharmacy with Second Harvest Food Bank on the uh, peninsula. And so what happens is in her clinic, which is many Hispanics with prediabetes, she writes a prescription for lentil soup. And they say, I don't know how to cook it, and I don't know where to get the ingredients. No problem. Second Harvest Food Bank has it. Please pick it up at the food pharmacy on your way out writing prescriptions for healthy food. So I think as a physician, if you could get on bar, and there, this is not the only food pharmacy that is out there. Look for food pharmacies, Michelle Hauser. Uh, I, I would love for that to um, go viral. Uh, right here, we'll go. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the campus, I don't know. I'm assuming these are medical students. Yeah, those two are. Okay. Yeah. So and seven. I don't know how long you want to go to. Pantry, and I work for the health service, and we have the team of dietitians that actually make food based on our food pantry availability. And so you might want to explore that. Which is going to be part of the boundary team. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, you all can't hear this, but we just made a connection tonight. So this is awesome. We can, so, okay. So it's, it's 7 o'clock. Yeah. And we're supposed to be on But you know, you, you never talked about salt. You didn't say a word about it. Really? Okay, if that's what you wanted me to talk. So it turns no, out. You don't have to. No, but I'll, here, here's, what I'll, here's how I'll answer that. It's pretty funny that you asked. On Friday, I'm flying, flying to Philadelphia for the American Heart Association sessions. And uh, I'm a moderator and I planned a nutrition controversy session. It's going to be on sodium, red meat, eggs, and dairy. Cheryl Anderson is going to handle the sodium. There's, there was a little IOM, Institute of Medicine, controversy over sodium because uh, there's a 2,300 milligram a day cutoff, and the American Heart wanted it to be 1,500 milligrams a day. But they couldn't find enough people that, who eat 1,500 milligrams a day to have any data to support that, so they said, you don't have the data, but it makes sense. From the practical perspective from sodium, I, I think we need to stop bickering about how many milligrams. Um, I actually participated with uh, Lisa God, Harnack, is that her name? We um, just published in circulation earlier this year. We actually got um, Hispanics, Asians, blacks, and whites from uh, Alabama and Minnesota and Palo Alto and basically, it's 75% processed food. It's not adding salt at the table. It's processed food. If you got rid of, if you, if you cut back on ultra-processed food, that would happen. Now, I have a great example of Campbell Soup, who swore they were looking out for your health. And so for looking out for your health, they swore they would reduce the sodium. And they did. And their product tanked, and nobody bought it anymore. And they said, we're not that concerned about your health. We're going to put it back. <laughs> And what we understood from the food industry is that if a single player lowers it, they're going to be out of whack and they're not going to be able to stick with it unless everybody lowers it at the same time. And the other thing, my reading of this, it's not my specialty, is if you were to lower 10% of the sodium every month for six months, you'd be at 50% sodium. And if you give people the original, they say, oh my God, that is, who oversalted this? So it's, it's an acclimation thing. It's a food industry thing. And the food industry would have to move together in concert. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So that so would be, I, I but want, you want to add want a perspective the, to that? I do. I thought so. I want so. the audience to know that after, after the talk now, a group of us are taking Christopher out to dinner. And I'm going to let all of you know what he ordered. <laughs> Well, we could, we could go on with this conversation forever, but, but it is 7 o'clock, so let me just do one more question. Ms. McLean, do you, do you have a question? No, I just had a question about definitions. Can you tell me what the difference is between steel-cut oats and ah. uh, oats? <laughs> I've heard that a That's, I have no idea what it means. That is fabulous. And I actually don't think I have a good answer, so I'm going to hope somebody's going to save me here. But really, the difference is between steel-cut or whole oats and quick oats. To me, it's sort of like whole wheat bread and white bread, although not quite the same. So the quick oats um, are, are more easily digested than the steel cut or the whole oats. So the idea is the glycemic index. So the, the more intact, and so another term that we're now using in the field is whole intact grains, not just whole grains, whole intact grains. So just as a quick build on that, because I think this is pretty fast, 
glycemic index is how fast the carbs in the thing you ate show up in your blood. And the glycemic index of whole wheat bread is identical to white bread. If you just switched from white bread to whole wheat bread, you got more nutrients. Whole wheat bread has more nutrients, but it shows up in your blood just as fast. How come? It's totally processed. It was stone ground. There's no digestion left, right? But if you have wheat berry salad, which I make, which is awesome, <laughs> or steel cut oats, then the digestion process takes longer. So I wouldn't, you're right, I don't have a good answer for steel cut, so I hope somebody saves me, but I would differentiate steel cut, which takes me an hour to cook, versus quick oats, which is three minutes with boiled water on it. I suspect the glycemic index is higher there than it is for the whole intact grain. Anybody got a quick steel cut thing for me? That's the only answer I want. Steel yes. cut? Steel cut. No, steel cut. No, we have to end on steel cut. Anybody going to save me? No one in the room knows what steel cut means. I'm saved. <laughs> so it is processed. It's not the whole oat. So, so the, the oat, it's like it's an oat groat. Yeah, oh, oat groat. And steel cut is if they cut it into like small pieces. And then rolled oats. About half. Steam it and pass it down. Right. And then quick oats is when they get the rolled oat and then they chop it up even more. There you go. Okay, so the whole intact <laughs> grain. Thank you. Thanks for saving me. This has been so much fun. Thank you for inviting Thank me. You. Yeah. How, how many of you learned something new tonight? All right, please join me in thanking Christopher and John for fascinating the session. So fun. And I hope you will all join us for our next event tonight. And I hope you will stay for a reception celebrating 35 years of the Wellness Letter. Thank you.